Hello. Um, Amy, just a heads up, your photo will be the main thing on this forever. I don't know how to change it. I've had somebody ask me in the past. So I just want to throw that out there. I'm perfectly fine with it. It's adorable. Um, but if you weren't okay with that, just wanted to let you know now because I think there's a way to um, make it go away somehow. So just throwing that out there. Um, I'm gonna wait one second while I get myself slightly organized. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, there are not a ton of questions tonight. So if you think of something or you have a question about anything that I'm saying, feel free to ask. Um, I'm going to go through some of the more specific questions first and then get to the more general topics. So somebody asked about the plant ironweed. Um, one of my favorite native plants, purple ironweed, it grows in the fall here in the south. Um, it can almost always be found growing next to goldenrod and it's just this beautiful burst of color in the fall of like bright golden um, yellow and bright purple. They're both really tall and bushy and I absolutely love ironweed. <clears throat> to me, it's what I consider a hyper native plant um, it's something that you can't find online. It's not something that a lot of people grow. And if they do grow it, they're typically not growing it to sell it as an herb. They're growing it as an ornamental. Um, however, this plant has a lot of uh, documented uses. Um, it's edible. It's not super tasty as a food. Um, I actually like the flavor that it adds to teas. I find it similar to the flavor of raspberry leaf. Raspberry leaf doesn't have a ton of flavor, but it adds a component to the tea because of how rich in tannins it is. And ironweed is also tannin rich. <clears throat> and they both have that like deep purple reddish color on the stems. Um, because they're super rich in tannins, they not only share some medicinal properties, but they can both be used as a dye. So you can make a dye from both of those. Um, because they are rich in tannins, they're both astringent herbs. Ironweed is especially noted for the minces. It is helped, it's used to help with menstrual pain. It's used to help with childbirth pain. Um, it's used as a gentle kidney tonic and blood purifier. It can help to regulate menstruation. It can also help to bring on a period or lessen a heavy flow. So overall, um, really helps with cramping and any sort of like stabbing and even just vaginal pain. So it's a really great um, ovarian herb, super good for hormonal health and pains that can be caused by that. <clears throat> As far as how it's used, this is one of those plants that I don't typically tincture. You absolutely could, and I've honestly never experimented with tincturing it. I just use it so much more in teas. Um, it's beautiful. It adds a nice pop of color to tea. Like I said, it adds that kind of like acidic, tart, astringent, tannin flavor to teas. It's in our... Um, it's either in our moon cycle sink tea or our 
mountain mama tea maybe it's in both um yeah so i usually use it in teas you could absolutely tincture it if you wanted to um doesn't have any topical uses that i'm aware of the next question is for people who speak a lot in their profession phone sales teachers etc what are some herbal preparations to prevent horse and or sore throats so if this is a consistent long-term thing, you're really going to work on, want to work on strengthening the vocal cords, um, which can be done through exercises. And that said, I would also focus on soothing the, the vocal cords if you're like excessively using them the, one day or for a weekend or something. So there's kind of two types of herbs here that I'm gonna recommend. Um, there are some vocal cord strengthening herbs and like anti-inflammatory that's going to help lessen the inflammation of the tissues and then there's more of your like soothing herbs for if you're like recovering from a seminar or something so for the vocal cord strengthening um and inflammation herbs my absolute number one choice would be osha however it can be very difficult to find osha sustainably i don't buy it online because i don't know a sustainable source online um, however, I do go to Colorado and that region once every year or so, and there are, you can go to a reservation and buy directly from the tribes around that area. So that's the only time that I buy OSHA. Um, so you might be able to know someone growing it or find somebody who knows how to harvest it uh, mindfully. And if you do have that source, OSHA is incredible. Something that I use in place of OSHA sometimes is calamus root, angelica root, and cottonwood. Those are some of my favorite like throat, voice, vocal cord herbs. Those are warming and stimulating. I would not use those if you are like in the recovery phase and trying to soothe. Those are going to be more for just like overall strengthening of the vocal cords. Um, some other good herbs would be propolis, yarrow, mountain mint, and monarda. And I just want to point out uh -huh. if you happen to have our mouth swish, that is perfect for gargling with to hit your vocal cords. It's got propolis, yarrow, mountain mint, and myrrh. Um, that would be perfect, perfect. So you could also, for soothing, you know, things like marshmallow root, uh, plantain, really mucilaginous herbs, violet even, would be great. <clears throat> this person also asked, what do you use on plants that are infested with bugs or disease, such as mealybugs? I have never dealt with mealybugs before. Um, but I have dealt with a lot of other bugs on plants. And so honestly, just the general things that you hear. I don't know of any secrets other than those. Um, I know for mealy bugs, you really want to dry those suckers out. So the thing that I see commonly is people making a spray bottle with soap and water and alcohol. There's a lot of fungus stuff on plants where you just use soap and water. Um, you're specifically adding the alcohol for the mealy bugs to dry them out. And then, of course, diatomaceous earth is incredible for any sort of bugs and gnats on plants. You want to cover it heavily. The idea is that the plant will eat the diatomaceous earth and dehydrate themselves to death. Um, and then, of course, neem is another natural thing that people use a lot of. I, honestly, the thing that we should all do is avoid bugs, and you can really only do that with a dehumidifier and a fan for air circulation, which is interesting because there's a lot of plants that love humidity. So some people use a humidifier, but if you're prone to bugs, um, we're, we're prone to root gnats. You have to have air circulating. You have to have clean, cool, fresh air, no warm humidity. Uh, this person, also asked, what are your biggest tips for harvesting and saving seeds? 
And then they asked about um, my favorite heirloom tomato plants or plants in general. So I gotta be honest, I don't grow food. Um, we grow a little bit, but not really. We live way up on a hill, completely shade covered. So what we have used our property for is helping native plants to flourish and have a safe home. So things like golden seal, bloodroot, pipsisua, ginger, um, pitcher plant, uh, lilies, mayapple, trillium, um, all those like foresty plants. So we do have a couple gardens that we use, but we don't do a ton of that. I typically support local farmers for my food and my herbs. Um, we, I, if I had to choose a favorite heirloom plant, it would be corn. I'm completely fascinated by corn. I'm completely fascinated by the history of it, um, the different heirloom varieties, the colors. I am also very obsessed with the idea of seed saving and heirloom plants. Um, I've got a great book I would love to recommend right now if I can get my hands on it. This is called The Seed Underground, A Growing Revolution to Save Food. This is an incredible book. The Seed Underground by Janice Ray. But if you just look up The Seed Underground, A Growing Evolution to Save Food, that'll do it. Um, <clears throat> I think that saving seeds is one of the absolute most important and valuable things ever. And so that said, we do collect and save seeds and we do share seeds. We just aren't able to grow a ton up here. Luckily, the office that I moved into in October is in dead sunlight. So we are actually going to be growing some plants and food there that we can't grow here. And I'm really excited because I have a huge thing of seeds that we've been saving for a while. Um, we have a seed library at our local library here in Kingston Springs. And if you have access to that, you should absolutely take advantage of it. It's a really, really cool thing. There's a lot of elders in our community that have been keeping up with their seed genetics for generations. And seed libraries are them hoping and putting faith in younger generations to keep them going. So um, as far as tips go, when we um, buy organic food at the grocery or we get our produce from Harpeth Moon Farms or any other local farms, anytime there's seeds, we save them. So things like peppers, squashes, etc. And what we do is, you know, we'll cut them out, scoop them out, what have you, when, when we're processing the fruit or vegetable, um, rinse them in a strainer. Sometimes you got to really mash them to get all the pulp and whatnot off. And we just lay them out on um, either a mesh screen or our um, Excalibur dehydrator or a paper towel, nothing crazy. When I'm out harvesting, like wild harvesting, we save a lot of seeds, especially for plants that we don't want to harvest because they're fragile or rare um, in the fall. We might, you know, take a seed or two and bring it to our property. That's really how we've grown most of the plants on our property. Um, and by doing, when doing that, you can take a whole seed head, but it's kinder to the plant and its environment to tap it into your hand so that it still has some to drop in its area. And I typically always have paper bags on me for foraging and I'll just put them in there. Um, I take a little piece of paper, I write what it is, and then I fold that piece of paper into a little envelope around the seeds. Um, I've got just your average little plastic bin that closes that we organize those in, um, but you can use like an old cookie tin. Um, I've seen all kinds of cool ways of saving seeds. 
so I hope that helps. Uh, the question was biggest tips for harvesting seeds and saving seeds and a favorite heirloom variety of plant. Um, so I had somebody ask me about a yeast overgrowth that they think is contributing to overall lymph swelling. So of course there's a lot of things we can do to relieve swollen lymph nodes, but to get to the root of that, what's causing the yeast overgrowth and issue. Um, of course, the classic things that you hear when recovering from antibiotics or yeast infection, you really wanna avoid sugar. That is a super hard one for me, but it's so freaking import important. Um, raw garlic is one of the absolute most powerful things for yeast infections. So swallowing a clove as though it was a pill is great. Um, we make garlic honey. So I might use like a garlic clove that's been soaked in honey and swallow that. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of herbs that can be used here. <clears throat> this is actually the only time that I personally use echinacea. I don't know why I've never been super attracted to that plant for other reasons, but it is a very, very powerful antifungal, antiparasitic. So um, I will use things like garlic, echinacea, wormwood, or sweet annie. Um, I use Oregon grape root in place of golden seal, since golden seal is on the... Um, United Plant Savers list. And Oregon grape root is super powerful for doing everything that Golden Seal does. Um, I've got a tincture that I take for yeast right here. Let's see. It's got um, cinnamon, clove, olive leaf, organ grape, oregano, rosemary, Monarda, Mountain Mint, Sweet Annie, Wormwood, Pau de Arco, Yellow Root, Echinacea, and Yarrow. Some powerful shit right there. Um, you really don't want to take that long term. Uh, it's something that you want to take consistently for two weeks to like fight an infection. Um, these same herbs and this same tincture could be used if you have any sort of external yeast situation. You could literally just spray it on, maybe dilute it with a little bit of water. Um, and if you don't have access to a lot of those herbs, you can absolutely just use like things that you can get at the grocery, like garlic, cinnamon, clove, um, rosemary, sage, oregano, mint, all those super herbaceous herbs that are super high in volatile oils, uh, chaparral and lavender would also be in this category. Um, those are all going to be great for helping to rid the body of yeast, bacteria, any sort of fungal, anything. Um, and then as far as the swollen lymphs go, um, there's a lot of really great herbs out right now for helping to move the limps. In this, in this month's plant walk, I posted the first half of it already. The second half, I have been waiting to post, but it has been raining every single fucking day here. So I just haven't been able to get the last 15 minutes recorded. Um, but we go over a lot of plants that are wonderful for supporting um, not only the lymph nodes, but like fibrous tissue, cystic tissue, helping to just like thin, dissolve and flush all that buildup. Um, that's what these spring plants are here to do. So as well as taking something like that tincture I just mentioned for the yeast infection, you might also make yourself some daily infusions um, of like cleavers, chickweed, violet, red clover. Um, what am I missing? Chickweed, cleavers, violet. I feel like I'm missing one. But even if you just have those three in your yard, that would be incredible for helping support the lymph nodes right now. Um, Okay, next question. 
Okay, this is actually my last question, but it's like a very big one, which is why I saved it for last. So if either of you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, this person says, I would love to hear any tips on eco-friendly and sustainable packaging for products, shipping, etc., and any advice on FDA regulations, GMPs, etc. Um, so first of all, um, eco-friendly and sustainable packaging tips. When I first started, so probably my first two and a half years of business, um, I used a only recycled packaging. And I still use a lot of recycled packaging because when you are ordering supplies for your business, like the Boston round bottles, oil, alcohol, herbs, you know, all the things, a lot of that stuff is coming in a box. It's coming in a box with like craft paper or bubble wrap or those puffs, um, all that stuff. I save every freaking bit of it. Um, and I, when I ran out, I would put a little call out on Instagram of like, Hey, can, is anybody saving their packing supplies? Can I get some from you? If you have a friend that owns a business or like, if you've made friends with a local business near you, like a gas station or a liquor store or whatever, you can ask them to save their shipping supplies for you. And so for years I got by on using only recycled boxes and materials. The only thing that I was buying was tape. Um, and I would just write my shipping information right on the box. And then um, in the past two and a half years, I have graduated to um, buying recycled materials. And I still do, I still save and reuse packaging. Most of what I save and reuse now is the craft paper that comes in packaging and the craft paper shreds that come in packaging. I do also use peanuts and bubble wrap. I, I use all of it. Um, I, I do use my own boxes and envelopes though. And um, things like not using boxes for your products, like it really drives me up the wall when people put a tincture in a box and then they're putting that in a box to ship it. You know what I mean? Like when you go to a store and the item is in a box. Um, I think that that's so pointless and stupid. Um, so I now use Eco and Close. You, this person specifically said without breaking the bank, Eco and Close absolutely breaks the bank. So until you are at a high enough level where you are printing shipping labels and not writing them. You are sending a ton of orders out regularly. You need to save time on packaging. That was my biggest reason for switching to pre to buying expensive stuff is it would take me and three to four other people two solid weeks of shipping because, you know, we would bubble wrap, tape, paper wrap, tape, um, make it look pretty, put it in a little box. Well, now that I'm using my own branded boxes from Eco and Clothes and shreds, I literally just like box, shred, paper, the end. So now, even though I have double the sales that I used to, it only takes three people less than a week. So, you know, it's that part, it's that time in business growth where your business has grown enough that time is actually way more valuable than money. Um, so if I can save paying three people, three extra people for two weeks, you know, it pays off for me to buy the expensive boxes and stuff. But um, I literally have a shed at the office just for shipping materials. And most of it is giant trash bags that I have saved everything that my bottles arrive in and also, I share space with another business, Meg of Sister Nettle, and she saves all her packaging stuff for me as well. So we do a ton of recycling. Um, another hot tip is I use a paper shredder, um, just an Amazon Basics shredder. 
and I shred cardboard and I make my own cardboard crinkles that your products ship in a box in. And that's very time consuming, but I hate wasting cardboard. So again, whenever me and Meg receive bottles, jars, herbs, et cetera, in boxes, we break them down, we use a box cutter, we cut them. Um, I save those for like about a month. I have a massive stack and me or somebody else literally sits in one spot for like four to five hours and just shreds all the cardboard and we make giant bags of shreds for packing orders. Uh, I hope in the next year or two to buy a very fancy cardboard shredder so that instead of having to break them down and cut them in tiny pieces and sit there and do one piece at a time, I can literally break down a box and toss it in a shredder and it just goes um, Okay, as far as FDA and GMPs, I feel like for some reason, everybody, myself included, makes this seem scarier than it is. And then instead of just doing it, they are like, how do I do it for a really long time? You just have to go to the FDA website and look up regulations for the type of products that you're making. And you just have to go through all that stuff. It's going to take you, you know, a couple days and copy and paste all the links that apply to you. Um, you know, for example, me, I make several different categories of products, uh, topicals, food items, alcohol items, ingestibles, items for pets, uh, all kinds of stuff. And those are all different categories that have their very own FDA regulations and GMPs. Not only that, but different herbs have their own regulations and GMPs. S literally storage, how you store them, what temperature you store them at. Every single thing is regulated if you want to, you know, be up to codes. And no one can say, here's what, it, here's what the GMPs and FDA regulations are. Literally no one can do that because it depends on what you're making. So you just have to go to the website and glean the information that applies to you and create your own SOPs, which is standard operating procedures. And that's going to say, you know, um, I store my products at this temperature. I use these containers to store my products. Um, what's another example? These are the cleaning supplies that I use. These are the materials that I use. Uh, this is the temperature that we keep the building at. Here's how we control moisture. We have a HEPA filter going at all times. Here's where I purchase equipment. Here's how we clean it every time. You know, like if, for example, if you were to get looked into by a health inspector, the first thing they're gonna ask for is your SOPs. And they're going to want to see how you consistently follow the same procedures. And so you need to write that out in such a way that's like, here's how we do this. Here's how we do this. When we come in in the morning, we do this. We only use um, silicone and stainless steel equipment. All stainless steel and silicone equipment is washed at 200 degrees with Dawn dish soap and left to air dry. And then we wipe it out with alcohol. I'm just making stuff up, but you know what I mean? Like you have to just list it all out. And then another thing that they want is, um, batch control. So you also need to look up the FDA label regulations. And, you know, one of the things that you need is batch numbers. Those batch numbers need to be able to show what day you made that recipe, who made it, um, exactly how you made it, exactly what brand of ingredients you use. Like you're supposed to be able to control everything. And it's very, 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 very strenuous and intense. So the truth is most people do not do it. 
and most people get to the size that I am at and was at when I decided to get an office space and hire employees, etc. Most people, when they get to that point, instead of doing what I did, they hand their recipes over to a co-packer because a co-packer is going to do all that for you. They're already a certified safe kitchen. They're already up to health codes and inspections. They're already organic certified or whole foods, whole body certified or whatever. And you don't have to think about or deal with any of that. And so that's why most businesses do that. And I do not blame them one fucking bit because it is very difficult. And what's worse is most towns, unless there's other herbalists in your town, which is usually not the case, um, they have no idea what to do with you. So when you try to get certified with the health department and all that, they're confused and To me, nothing is worse than a government official that is confused by their job because they don't want to fuck up. So they're going to hold you to the same standards as a food restaurant, which doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. So I hate to not have a bunch of fun advice, but it's the worst part of this job. Um, But you got to do it if, I mean, if you want to, you know, and so... The biggest piece of advice that I give to people that literally took me two horrible years, my first year of owning a business, of getting super scary mail and trying to do big business things, um, I had gotten a business, I got my business license in Nashville, like in the city. And I got all this scary mail all the time saying, talking about sales tax and all this stuff that I wasn't ready for. I was making like I was doing like two markets a year and making products for my friends and family at the time. Well, when I came out here in Cheatham County where I live to get a business license, the lady at the time, I think this was like 2016, was like, do you make more than $10,000 a year? Like, do you profit more than $10,000 a year? And I said, hell no. Um, from your herbal products business. And she said, okay, well then all you need is a minimal activity business license. And that's $10. And it means that you do not have to pay taxes. You are not held to the same standards as a normal sized business. And you won't get all that scary mail hounding you about business tax, sales tax, and all that shit. Um, employment, self-employment tax, et cetera. So until you are making over $10,000 on your business, operate under a minimal activity business license. Um, That also said, of course, there are cottage laws where when you're that small, you know, certain things don't apply to you. You can make stuff in your kitchen, blah, blah, blah. Um, You do still have to follow GMPs and all that. but you don't have to have like a certified kitchen and stuff like that. So look into your local city, county cottage laws. Honestly, the best thing to do is go to your county clerk and ask them. And when they say, I don't know, you fucking sit there and you wait until they find out what you need to do. Um, And yeah, I mean, you know, If you want to worry about FDA and GMPs, just make sure that you really know what you're signing up for and that you are committed to doing this all the way, (laughs) because it's a lot. It's a huge pain in the butt. Um, I would love to end on a lighter note, but (laughs) that is the last question. Uh... Let me see if I can think of something fun to say. Other than all that, being your own boss and owning your own business is like the best, you know? (laughs) So just keep that in mind. And also I say this all the time and I wish people would take it seriously. Grow slow. 
a lot of people start their business and they they look to you know me and what other whatever what whatever other herbalist they like um and they think okay she's doing this i gotta do that i want to do that how do i do that but what people don't stop to think about is how long i've been doing it and the fact that i'm just you're seeing me just now do these things well i've been operating for five plus years not doing those things you know like it's been a very slow gradual process of like upgrading equipment upgrading my order amounts upgrading where I source my herbs, upgrading, you know, whatever, getting an accountant, getting a graphic designer, um, upgrading from printing labels at home, uh, hiring my first employee for help. Uh, you know, like all these came one at a time and each time it felt like such a great accomplishment. And I see a lot of tiny businesses trying to do it all at once. And that's amazing. I, I didn't even know what any of these things were, you know, until I found out, honestly, um, the hard way it felt like for everything. But you don't have to do that stuff. So just remember that when you're like on the computer, freaking out over a scary piece of mail, on the phone, just in loops trying to get to the bottom of something, take a deep breath and remember, I don't have to do this. You know, it's a choice that has to do with your size, your audience, where your location. So just try to g grow slow. Um, I actually have an entire video coming out about how I price my products. Uh, it's scheduled to post on Patreon April 5th. Um, or calculate costs to make a profit margin. But, uh, you know, the video is gonna go a lot more into detail, but essentially what I'm talking about is like, again, you know, kind of like what I'm saying, my prices when I was working from my home in my home kitchen, um, I was typing and printing my own labels. I didn't have a graphic designer. I didn't have a photographer. I didn't have an accountant. I didn't have a separate set of rent and utilities at the office. I didn't have employees. I wasn't paying for pre-printed labels. I wasn't paying, you know, all these in business insurances. Like I have probably $10,000 a month in expenses now that I did not have when I worked from home. And so my cost for my uh, products when I was working from home were about half the price that they are now. So what goes into your cost? How much do you pay yourself? I don't pay myself per hour. I think that that's stupid. I work nonstop. I would go broke if I did. Um, what I did with a financial advisor was looked at how much money do I spend as a mother person a month? That's what I pay myself. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, look at how much do you need to make a month to survive? Uh, what's that number? How much did you spend on the bottles and the labels that you're using to make products? Um, herbs, oils, your menstruum, all that, you know, all that stuff. So I would say the easiest thing to do is buy the supplies that you need for one month. Um, or one release or whatever, take all those invoices, add them up, add that to what you need to make to survive in a month, survive, like truly the bare minimums, rent, utilities, food, gas, um, divide that by the amount of products that you're able to make. And that number is probably going to be pretty low. It is for me at least. And so that's how you price your products um, is, you know, all those things need should be factored into it. And then of course it is good to look around at what other people are, are offering their products for. Um, but another thing that I talk about in this video is kind of like I was just saying when budding herbalists 
who are, you know, looking to their, the herbalist that they look to, like, uh, what's her name? Wooden Spoon Herbs, uh, Wooden sp Wood Spell Apothecary, um, Mythic Medicine Stories. Well, guess what? All of those people have separate offices, GMPs, FDAs, employees, CPAs, all those things that I just said. So if you're at home making your own labels and doing your own photos and all that, your products do not need to be the same price as theirs. Um, of course, it's good to like look at what the prices are so that you just kind of know what the prices are for those items. Um, you can also experiment a little bit. And if people aren't buying that and you think it has to do with price, run a sale and see if people do buy it, then you know, okay, if I make this a little lower, people will buy it. Um, but yeah, everything you spend money on should be factored into your cost of sales there's like a lot of formulas out there like people say take your cost of goods sold times it by three i don't really do that because again truly if i did that my products would be completely unaffordable um i also that's another thing like that's very important to me is that my products are accessible so some of my products are priced uh lower than they might should be um for example, my two ounce tinctures are $24. Uh, I see people who are still working from home, designing and printing their own labels, selling two ounce tinctures for 30 plus. I wouldn't, I would never do that. But you know, that's just me thinking about my community. And that's another thing is like, my business grew through sale, selling to friends and family. And so like that has a lot to do with my prices. Whereas some random person who's never done herbalism or skincare before might be like, I think it would be really cool to start a skincare company. Well, they're not thinking about making things cheaper for people because they don't know their audience, right? So they might be going for the highest dollar amount. So who's your audience? My audience is people that I know and love, people that I want to be in community with, people that I want to visibly see thrive and heal. And I would feel like shit if the only thing holding them back from that was money. So these are all other things to think about. Now that said, I do make contributions from every single sale that I make. And that is another major thing. Um, I think I've talked about this in a video before, but um, when I first got together with a financial advisor, I had a major donation problem. I don't want to call it a problem, but that's what she called it, a major donation problem. What that means is I donate to most campaigns that I see that need donating. For me, that specifically comes from a place of poverty trauma um, and coming from the fact that I grew up without money. I also grew up in the system um, of capitalism where I was managing restaurants for under $30,000 a year, barely able to pay my rent in Nashville. And so now that I have created a life for myself that's pretty freaking inexpensive, and I've also created a business for myself where I can pretty much control the amount of money that I make. When I see people who are stuck in that same system that I was stuck in for most of my life, unable to survive and definitely unable to thrive, it makes me incredibly happy to contribute to them and to help them. So community care, mutual aid, that is fulfilling for me. It literally like makes me feel so fucking good. And so when I met my financial advisor, she was looking at the amount that I was donating each month. And she said, you don't have a savings account. You don't even have life insurance. You have shit insurance, like health insurance. You don't have a Roth IRA. You're not contributing any money to your retirement. What are you thinking? donating to other people and that was a huge wake-up call for me and I definitely realized um I mean she put me on a budget with donating which is great I, I should be you know um 
I do have those things now as of today, actually. I just got life insurance. So if anything happens to me, Augustine has money, stuff like that. Um, upgraded my health insurance and my business insurance and all that. Anyways, all that said, uh, she challenged me to think about what would it be like if you factored that into your cost of goods sold. And that was a hard question for me because I'm very passionate about redistributing wealth, but I'm also very passionate about keeping my products accessible. And at this point, my business is a little bit too big to use the sliding scale option safely um, because I have no control over who finds my website and how they use it. And, you know, if they were to choose the lower option, it would be very hard for me. Um, like if everyone were to choose it, I'm not sure how clear I'm being anymore because I'm starting to get really deep here, but that was a hard question for me. And so what I, what I decided to do is I used to donate 10% of my sales and then some like 10% of sales. And then I would also just voluntarily contribute. Now I have a fixed percentage, which is 1%, which is a lot of money at the end of the year um and i have a personal budget for contributing and i have a button on my website now where if people who are able to want to also contribute to these organizations they can tack some on and that was my personal way of keeping my prices low enough that i think most people most people can access them yet still donating and redistributing wealth. And then also, you know, buying, sourcing your products from small farms and not big herb stores, sourcing your supplies from small stores and not big stores, you know, uh, paying people when you can to help you. Those are also ways of redistributing wealth. So there's a lot to that. Um, that I could really dive down, but there's a little bit of a touch on it. And again, April 5th, I'm posting a video on pricing your products. That video also covers a topic that I get asked about here a lot, which is how do you maintain originality and not copy people? Or like, at least how do you navigate copying versus not copying in a field that's based on traditional recipes? So I also dive in that video onto that, that question. Um, thank you, Amy, I appreciate that very much. Okay, I think I got to everything. Yep, okay. All right. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for your questions. And I'll see you next time.